Right then, it's time for Franz to talk about the speed language. Yes. Uh, yeah, so my name is Franz Garman. I'm a PhD student at Linköping University in Sweden. Uh, in my final year, so I'm looking for postdoc positions, if anyone has any leads. Um, but I'm here to talk about Spade, which is a hardware description language that is inspired by modern software languages. Which I found quite fun that Nickel also had as a title of one of his slides. Um, so, uh, but his inspir inspiration is Haskell, and mine is also Haskell, but yeah. It's, um, um, yeah. So, uh, what do I mean by this, inspired by modern software languages? Well, we have these... Uh, in software, we have quite a lot of different languages. Uh, I went to the Wikipedia list of programming languages, pick the ones that are relevant, i.e. people use. I know people use, so this is biased. But there's essentially one new programming language that has gained traction in the past, per year in the past 30 years. So there's quite a lot of info innovation here. On the hardware side, it looks more like this. We have very long in VHDL uh, over in the 80s there. And then we have a few of these modern languages, uh, blue spec, Clash, and Clash, Median, Chisel, Spinal, and Amaranth. Um, but there's still a lot of uh, ideas and concepts we can take from the top bar and bring into hardware because there's obviously a lot more things there. Um, so I want to start off by talking about what things I think we can achieve by stealing things from software, and then I'll get into some features that I stole uh, or ideas that I stole to make this work. So first of all, we have this idea of fearless refactoring in software, where you can take a um, you can take a project, you can make a bunch of large scale changes to that project, and once the code compiles again, um, most things will still work. Uh, I would claim that's not the case in in Verilog and VHDL. Um, so, but it's something I think we should be able to get in hardware as well. Um, we need abstractions that make sense for hardware. So, in software. Languages that are built for a specific domain have abstractions for that domain. Web development languages have abstractions for the web. Uh, Rust, dealing with memory safety, has abstractions for around the memory to make that safe to work with. So we need abstractions for hardware in our case. Um, we can't have a much performance overhead. If we're building hardware, we have performance requirements sort of implicitly. So if we, the language would be 50% slower than writing in Verilog, the language isn't generally very useful, um, at least not for the things I want to do. Uh, and then we need tooling. The tooling in hardware is awful. Uh, I think we should improve that. Uh, so these four points are things I want to steal from software. And now I want to go through a few features in Spade that I think contribute to this, and then I'll get back to this at the end. So the main thing that I provide with Spade is pipelining. Uh, when I started Spade, I think I was like one or there might be un one or two more languages that did this. Um, but most modern HDLs don't. So on the left, we have a, uh, a description of a pipeline, and on the right, we have the resulting hardware. Uh, the important parts are these three statements. The top statement, pipeline of two, says that this is a pipeline, and its latency is two. So if you feed something in, you'll get the corresponding results two cycles later, and that's sort of part of the public API of this pipeline. You don't have to look into the body of this code to figure out what the latency is. And then the two reg statements. So a reg statement tells the compiler that any variable above this statement should be put into a register. And when you refer to that variable later, you refer to the registered version. So x is defined before the reg, but when you refer to x after the reg, then you refer to the pipeline version. Uh, and this sort of decouples the description of the pipeline from the description of the computation. So you can move the reg, reg statements around freely, freely, add or remove them without affecting the output of the hardware. And you can clearly, you can probably figure out which reg statements correspond to which registers in the graph. This is kind of nice when designing the hardware, but it becomes more important when you need to change something in your design. So this G block uh, on the upper right, uh, if we synthesize this and realize that, wait, this G block isn't fast enough to be a combinational block, we need to pipeline it. We need to do something like this, bake some stages into there. Um, normally, then we would have to go through the code with a fine comb and figure out which S1 should we change to S2, which S2 should we change to S3. Um, but with Spade, we make the change to G, uh, and then we, we compile, and the Spade compiler will first tell us that, no, you need to instantiate G as if it were a pipeline. You specify the depth, uh, just so that if you make changes in the future, you can go back and see, when I wrote this code, I assumed the depth, depth was 2. Uh, now it is something else. I need to look into this and make sure the code still works. That's more relevant when you have feedback in your pipeline. In this case, we don't. So here, you could just <laughs> increment it. Um, 
And then, of course, if you look at this figure, you clearly see that there's an edge there that is problematic. It bypasses the pipeline stages. This code will not do what it did originally. It probably won't compute anything useful at all. Luckily, we don't have to look at the figure to figure this out because the spade compiler will give us this error message saying, you're using the variable x before it's ready. It won't be available for another stage, so you need to, do, you need to add a reg statement somewhere, probably. Uh, and of course, the change we need to make in this case is to add another set of registers so that everything is aligned with G. Uh, and because we have this reg statement, we can just put reg there and update the public interface of our pipeline to match the new stage. The compiler will tell us to do that as well. And once we've done that, we've retimed the circuit, and the compiler told us what to change at all times, so we could just mechanically go through and make the change uh, and get a higher F max on our circuit without thinking, really. So there are more features to the pipeline. I mentioned you can have um, feedback and stuff if you're building a processor that's important. Uh, but this is a short demo of that. Um, now, I wanted to do a demo here. Um, so I, I've been working on this camera project. Uh, so I have a Raspberry Pi camera on the back of this, an HDMI monitor on the front, uh, and I wanted to like show off that this works. Unfortunately, this monitor that I bought to be able to bring here is in portrait mode, la not landscape mode. Rotating an image 90 degrees is not something we have the technology for. So despite having the most comfortable flight in a while, I wasn't able to make this work. But I can show you that I can take a 90 degree rotated picture of the airplane wing, so um, it works. Uh, the reason I'm talking about this isn't part to, is in part to show off, but I also want to talk about how the camera protocol implementation works in Spade, because I'm quite pleased with it. So this Raspberry Pi camera uses something called CSI2. It's a protocol used by, I think, pretty much every camera in mobile phones. Uh, so it's quite commonly used. Um, the basic idea is we have one to four lanes and the clock signal. Uh, on each of these lanes, we need to look for the start of the transmission to see when our bytes are coming in, because we're not always transmitting on this protocol. Um, once we have the start of the transmission, we can merge these individual lanes into a single stream of data. On that stream of data, we can look for packet headers. So things come in packets, we look for the headers to figure out what things are. We can separate the packets into short packets, which are like metadata, long packets, which are pixel data, usually. Uh, and then we can get the pixel data by looking for packets with a specific header. The reason I bring this up is because if I put the spade code on the right and the description on the left, we can go through this and see how closely it maps. So we start off with one to four lanes. The Raspberry Pi camera only exposes two lanes, so I've hard-coded this for two lanes. So it's a, an array of two bytes. We need to look for the start of packets. That's called alignment in the lingo, I guess. Uh, so we run an aligner, we get the aligned lanes. We need to merge the lanes, so we run a merger to get a merged lanes. We can then take this merged stream of bytes and convert it into a stream of packet headers uh, using the into packet headers function. Then we separate the packets into short packets and long packets. Uh, and then finally, we can look, get the pixel data by taking the, pix the stream of headers and combining it with a stream of data uh, so when we find the start of a packet, a pixel packet, we know that the next incoming bytes of data are actually pixel data. And hopefully you can see that the mapping between description and code is quite, uh, quite close. There's also nothing built into Spade for either streams or CSI2, so this is sort of an emergent thing that I was able to build using the abstractions in the language. Uh, and I want to briefly uh, show what one of these looks like. So this into pixel headers, into pixel streams, sorry, uh, looks something like this. Each stream is just a struct containing a single field with the type option. And the option is a value that is, may or may not be present in every clock cycle. So when there is a header, there is will be, the header will be present. Otherwise, it's like, yeah, there's no header. Then we can add a method to this header stream. So the header, long header stream can be turned into a pixel stream. And the way we do that is by keeping track of how, how many pixels or how many bytes we have left of the stream, which are pixel data. So we reset that to zero. If we don't have a pixel data, or if we don't have a header yet, it's zero. If we get a header with, a, with the correct ID, we save that, okay, we need to pull 100 pixels from the stream. 
And if we don't have a new header, we just decrement the number of pixels we have left until we reach zero. And the pixel stream is then taking data from the stream, from the full stream, not just the header stream, as long as there is pixel data, as long as we have pixels left to output. Um, so each of the method calls previously looked something like this. Uh, and you can see that there are no specific stream features here. This is sort of an emergent thing in the language which I'm pleased with. So I really like tools, as I guess you can imagine from my uh, presentation yesterday. Um, so I think a good language needs good tools to be successful. One of those tools is the build tool. Uh, if you, in software, pretty much every language has a build tool, like Python has pip, JavaScript has npm, Scala has Scala build tool, Cargo, Rust has Cargo. Uh, the main thing these do is to pull in libraries. So for the camera project here, I, was, I need an HDMI implementation, I need a DRAM implementation, and I need some uh, stubs for working with the ECP5 primitives. So I can specify those, the build tool will download them from Git and use them. We can also have plugins here. Um, so I didn't want to write my own DRAM controller because that's way more work than I have time for. Um, but I want to use Lite DRAM, which provides a DRAM controller. Um, and then I built a plugin for generating this Lite DRAM controller from a config. So you can run Swim plugin Lite DRAM setup and then Swim plugin generate. It will run Lite DRAM. It will generate a spade wrapper around the Lite DRAM that I can instantiate in my code. And of course, we can specify how to build a project. And the end result is that you can go from a clean install of Rust, which is a single command as well. So you, then you do cargo install swim to install the build tool. Then you can do swim install tools to install OSS CAD suite, installing EOSIS, next PNR, all of that good stuff. Uh, then we can clone a project and run swim upload. Uh, and then I figured out today that since Tim was giving out these FOMO boards, I should add support for FOMO. So if you want to have a blinking, uh, blinking FPGA like this, talk to Tim to get a FOMU, and then you can run swim in it, and then the board FOMU PVT, and you can run swim upload, and that should get you all the way to a blinking thing in your USB port. So in conclusion then, I talked about these four points at the start of the presentation. I want to go back and, and revisit these and show off where things fit in. So we need fearless refactoring to be able to make changes to the code after the fact uh, when we forgot that. For example, they, we forgot that a multiplier needs a bunch of registers after it to be efficient. So pipelining is a very important concept here. Um, you can retime spade circuits without thinking. Uh, spade also has a Rust-inspired type system. So it has pretty much all the features of the Rust type system, and that thing prevents a lot of different bugs. So you can encode way more information in your project and do this fearless refactoring thing. We need abstractions for hardware. So again, pipelines is such a common feature, so we should have an abstraction for it. Uh, Spade also has memories and ports as sort of built-in, so you can reason about a port, the concept of a port, connecting ports, moving ports around, etc. Uh, and then we can build other abstractions, like the stream interface I talked about isn't really built into the language, but all the features to, talk, to describe a stream are built into the language, so we can build these abstractions. We needed a low performance overhead. And Spade is an RTL level description. So um, unlike some other HDLs, this is certainly not high level synthesis. It's also not doing anything f really fancy. It's just a nicer way to describe RTL level descriptions with a bunch of features to help you out with that. And finally, uh, tooling. It has a compiler that gives helpful error messages. Maybe that's also useful for LLMs. It sounds like it is. Um, but it's also useful for us as users. And we have a build system that does dependency management and upload and all of that. And of course, as I talked about yesterday, I was disappointed with the waveform viewers that exist, so I built my own waveform viewer called Surfer. And there is a link to the project. Thank you, Franz. Do we have any questions? We have one here. Thank you. So uh, the circuit diagrams in like your earlier slides, did, was that generated by your tool, or did you draw that manually? No, uh, I drew that. Okay. okay. Uh, my um, hot take is that you should never have to draw out the circuit when designing it or when you're trying to analyze it. The, the, two, the language should be expressive enough that you don't need to go through that step. So. 
I was just shocked by hearing that you should never draw a circuit. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it was a hot take. I agree, only as a last resort. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, could you say something more about what kinds of pipelines you can handle? So in, particularly, I'm curious about many pipelines, well, you know, there are two kind of extreme styles of pipelines. One is where you think of the data path and then a controller that has controls the whole pipeline versus completely self-timed. In other words, it's handshaking between every stage and it's el very elastic. And in particular, stages can take varying degrees of time. For example, if one of them is accessing memory, it might have a cache miss, et cetera. So elastic pipelines is one question. Then pipelines may have alternate paths, fork joins, uh, with the different paths taking different latencies depending on the data, et cetera. Yeah. Then pipelines with feedback. So all of these are more complex pipelines. So can you handle these? So pipelines with feedback can be handled uh, quite nicely at the moment. Um, I have basic support for these sort of elastic things where you can delay a, you can put a condition for a stage to accept its input. And then you have a stage.valid and stage.ready uh, thing that you can say, you can query like if you're, is the next stage ready to accept my input, which is useful for like a register file where you only want to write when you have valid data. Um, the problem with that is I started implementing it and then I realized that it needs to propagate information about the ready validness to sub pipelines. And I don't have a way to, of doing that at the moment. So it's a bit crippled. I mean, also your API level interface about latency <laughs> needs to, is, is now elastic, right? It's no longer three steps. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, so I think I need a way to specify that the latency isn't known, um, but that should be quite easy to do. Um, but the big problem is it can't propagate the ready valid information at the moment. All right, well, I'd like to congratulate you on your last year. <laughs> Will this outlive the existence of Franz Klar at Lynn Shopping? <laughs> uh, I very much hope so. This was a hobby project from the start. I hope I can continue, take this project to wherever I go next. Uh, so okay, that, that's, that's going to be my goal at least. Thank you, it will be very useful. So I have a question actually. Uh, my, my belief is that people should create more languages to uh, support that is that makes it more productive but on the output side have you considered so I guess you're going to Verilog now yes uh, have you considered looking into one of the IRs because I my hope is that this is where everything will meet eventually um, I've looked at it I've considered doing circuit um, but it's a pain to compile it's not exactly clear which of the 10 dialects I should compile to uh, Maybe I can talk to Jack about that, if he knows more. Um, at the moment, it's not really a priority, because I'm more interested in the language design. Um, I've also looked at Calyx, which is kind of a circuit dialect. Um, but I'm more interested in the language design, so that kind of engineering work is not something I want to do at the moment. Cool, thank you. Uh, and I think with that, we will thank the speaker, Jan. <laughs>